you expect? It says we're live. We're, we're live. Okay, so this is uh, story time. Wait a minute. I want to see. Yeah, there's a picture. All there's right, our here picture we go. Of story time. Yes. Story time. This and is Ginger Cook, and this is story time with acrylic painting. What a And today I'm going to be doing two landscapes and talking a story. None of my stories are in order. Just how I, depending <laughs> on how long I think the videos are going to take, and just what I feel like talking about today, really. So there's no like chronological order of any of these stories. But, you know, when you've lived a few years, you've got stories, you know, <laughs> just the way it is. I've always had stories because my life has been rather unusual. So, uh, so today we're going to talk about how I, how I moved to Texas and became a slumlord. Yeah, I know, that's a startling title, isn't it, right? But, you know... Um, I'm kind of kidding, but not so much, right? <laughs> just not so much. The story will let us know. You can just decide, was I a slumlord or just, uh, you know, who knows? But in any event, as I'm painting along, this is not a tutorial. We do tutorials on Mondays. But this is just uh, some, uh, we have an online art school with uh, lots of students, and those we offered a special uh incentive this year between November and the end of December if our, any of our students signed up as annual members instead of monthly uh, they got anywhere between a 6 by 8 painting like this for a red member annual to a, a 12 by 16 for a three year purple and I, a lot of people said oh, I mean I get a real ginger cook painting if I sign up for a year and we said yeah so a lot of people took us up on us so have a lot of paintings to do so I, I have a lot of stories, so that's the genesis of it. Again, not a tutorial, but nonetheless, we're going to be painting something. Yes and yes? We run out of stories, we run out of paintings. That's it. Whichever comes first. Yeah, huh? Well, that's for sure right. So I'm just doing a little mixing. I don't think you can see much of what I'm mixing, but that's just how it is. Let's see, where's my raw umber? So, Cinnamon, Cinnamon's dad and I got divorced when she was about 16. She just turned 16, and um, they were, so we, anyway, we, we had a parting of the ways, and um, uh, I had met George and uh, when I was selling cars, and um, he had seen a seminar uh, kind of a blurt for a seminar by a um, man by the name of Robert Allen. And um, Robert Allen was talking about real estate, you know, and how you could, uh, you know, you know, buy derelict old houses and fix them up and sell them. And, you know, so George ended up going to his seminar, which was very expensive back then. That was back in 1989. And five thousand dollars was a lot of money, particularly for us and everything. And um, but he had this; he was very popular. He had all these people, like Anthony, Tony Robbins was at his um, um, at his seminar. He had all these guest speakers, real famous ones. And uh, he talked to us, told us about neurolinguistic programming and all that stuff, and which was really big at the time. And I was getting a little tired of selling cars. And uh, the opportunity came up for us to, you know, go to the seminar because actually George worked, took an extra job. Uh, besides, he was selling cars with me. He took an extra job, welding because he got his degree in welding in college, junior college. And um, so anyway, um, uh, George, you know, went and welded for like a couple of weeks to get that five thousand dollars, and then which, is, and then we went to that seminar decided that's what we needed to do was have rental properties. And I also had another friend, that, you know, a good family friend, that he had retired with rental properties and he had a nice income from them. And I thought, well, you know, that's kind of passive income. That's, that ha you have to understand, that sounded very good to me. Uh, you know, if you could do something like that, that really sounded, that sounded kind of nice. And so uh, G George did some more research and um, it was determined that uh, if we, uh, right, Texas was uh, in a slump. 
they had lost the oil business. They were in like the uh, free fall. And so uh, they were literally giving away property here, literally giving it away. It was like the California land grab, only Texas. And if you had money, you could, um, you could get a lot, you know, you could, you could really do well. You could buy these houses. People had lost their jobs and just got up and, and walked out. It was a little bit like uh, Southwest Anchor Watt. If you're not familiar with that, what that is, um, uh, Anchor Watt was, this, was discovered in Cambodia and it's a city that was hidden in the jungle. And uh, when it was discovered, I think if you'd have to Google it to see exactly what I'm talking about, but when it was discovered, uh, the, uh, the food was still on the tables and uh, it, it, the people had just packed up and left overnight like, uh, and, and didn't take anything with them. They just left, they just got the heck out of, that's what the expression is, got, got the heck out of Dodge, yes? And um, so that was, you know, that was really, um, that was really interesting. And so that was what happened in Texas. Um, people just moved out. Um, and, 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 you know, they, they lost their jobs. They couldn't stay. So they, uh, so they moved out. Um, and... So when we came to Texas, we, what, what we did was we, I sold my house in California, which was worth some money in San Diego, of course, property. And we took that money and we bought 50 rental properties. But we, we fi financed them through the VA because the VA had foreclosed on most of these houses. Okay. So now, and there was a couple of ways that where we, we bought properties. There was that way and then Charles Fuller, which you know was a was a um, was a young guy that in his 30s that lived in Texas, and he George had uh, found his book, and it was um, he he wrote a book on how to buy foreclosure property at the foreclosure auctions, and uh, you know a lot of banks were foreclosing, and this was before they ever got back. So the banks started to sell them; they had to foreclose on them, and if you could get to the homeowner first you could maybe either offer to save their mortgage or offer them to buy them out so they didn't, this didn't show up on their credit, okay? So there were a couple of options and different ways where you could buy, buy the property. Um, which is kind of neat in itself, okay? So, and anyway, so we, we met Charles uh, Fuller and um, I remember him because he was he I mean he was famous he was doing seminars and he was only in his 30s and he was sort of a quite frankly sort of an arrogant kid I felt but uh, you know I was you know probably in my 30s he was in my 20s and you know anyway and then to get the VA properties we um, we we met a, a real estate guy wh whose father happened to be head of the, uh, in Kansas, of the VA. So while technically you could buy, you, anybody could, you know, buy, a, a, you know, a VA foreclosure and uh, put, uh, put a bid on it anyway and see if you got it. You didn't buy it. You had to put a bid on it and see if you got it. Um, you couldn't do more than a few houses. They weren't going to do it. And we've got 35 houses through the That's VA. That's more than a few. Yeah, and it never would have gone through but um, his dad pulled strings, you know? That's the only way this ever would have worked, his dad pulled strings. And I'll tell you more about how we found those houses, but I gotta dry this. Ooh, cliffhanger again. Okay, so when we got to Houston, we didn't know anything about Texas or Houston or anything like that, okay? We really didn't. We were just totally clueless in Texas, right? You know, you've heard that expression, clueless in Seattle. 
Well, we were clueless in Texas. And uh, we rented an apartment in uh, what was got to be formally known as Guns Point. It was supposed to be Greens Point, but there was so much crime that um, it was referred to as Guns Point. But of course, when we moved into this apartment building, we had no idea. So the first thing we did when we was we when we got into this foreclosure stuff was we found a house in a nice neighborhood called, called Kingwood, and we bought that house on foreclosure. And um, it was a uh, four-bedroom house, and really very nice. It was a four-bedroom house in and, um, and Kingwood. And Kingwood is a little subdivision outside of Houston. And what made it, for those of you not familiar with Texas and Houston, the guy that invented Kingwood, because he really was kind of inventing stuff at the time, the guy, man that invented Kingwood, um, he had all these bicycle trails that ran behind the houses. And, uh, and the Kingwood just kept growing and growing. It's huge now. And, um, and, and they kept connecting bicycles. So if you live there, non-traffic bicycles, you know, just, just, I mean, it was a wonderful idea, isn't it, when you think about it? absolutely wonderful and um, so we had this four four bedroom house and um, my daughter Cinnamon had uh, come down from California with us and we were living in, in that house and we were buying um, we were buying uh, these properties and George had a big notebook and we, we had a picture every time so we went out every day with this guy um, to look at houses Okay, every day we were out there, um, very devoted. She picked us up, and we were looking at properties. And we had a notebook, and then we would figure out how much it would it cost to fix this up, because there were a lot of them were in really bad shape. How much it would it cost to fix it up? And then um, we would um, uh, go from there as far as um, is what you know how we were going to handle. You know, buying these properties, but but we had we had it was very organized, okay. So for, as far as what our intentions were, to um, to be able to do that, and so it, we'd go down to the, the, the we, and we kept you know we kept winning bids, and we ended up with literally thirty five houses, and we had to rent the rent them out. Now my oldest brother in the meantime had come down to live with us too. My oldest brother, Dennis, he's 10 years older than me. He wanted to invest, too. He was divorced and came. Well, I met him, and I said, listen, Dennis, you really, there's quite an opportunity here. You ought to come and invest in some properties. So um, he, 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 uh, he came down, too, and so he, he had a house with us. And he rented, lived in our house in uh, Kingwood, and uh, Cinnamon was living there, and uh, and we always referred to him as Uncle Dennis. And Uncle Dennis was a troublemaker. Uh, I don't know, because I had, if you've heard my story at all, I never grew up with him. Was he the I, oldest one? He was the oldest. I, I really only saw him at Christmas years before. I really didn't know anything about him, except that um, um, when my parents had the, uh, their party, when they were writing their book, my adopted parents, uh, he wasn't invited to the party, and uh, that was the you know that was the brother. I said if if somebody um, comes in with a with your uncle Dennis comes in with a gun, um, starts shooting people, get under the table. Man, that's a different story. It was a different <laughs> video. So, but anyway, we he didn't kill anybody, and so uh, I I decided that you know I invited invited him to come down right. Come on down to Texas. And so he came. And the problem with Dennis was that he was an alcoholic. And um, it, it kind of ran in the family. And um, I didn't drink for that very reason. I figured out in my 20s that drinking was not for me. And I just, I didn't have a, my face would go numb. I didn't have a good reaction. I had practically real memory loss if I drank anything and got too inebriated. I just didn't remember anything and I was one of those people that probably should never ever touch any alcohol and I figured that out in my 20s and never did. You know, maybe an occasional drink but was not a drinker. But Dennis, bless his heart, was a drinker. And um, 
So he was a drinker and a dog person, and that doesn't necessarily follow in any particular order, but he was those things, okay? <laughs> just, just saying, right? So anyway, Uncle Dennis came down with his old Ford Bronco and his dogs, and, um, uh, and he would, and then he got some real estate too. We helped him get some real estate too. We did a foreclosure for him. He was given this house. This, this a lot of houses were given to us too, besides the ones we bought through the VA. And this particular couple had given my brother their house. We we found it for him because um, we could only do so much. You know, we just didn't need any more property. But anyway, so he um, this family. Um, I don't know if they won the lottery or something happened. They came into some money, and they decided to move into a better house. And so they um, they gave their teenage son the house they were living in with his friends, and they said, "You all can live there." Okay, this "you all" stuff happened after I got to Texas. I never sat that said that in my life before I came to Texas, you all. But anyway, <laughs> it's now almost habitual. Um, my granddaughter Honey can do that too, but that's another story. Her, her you alls. But anyway, um, so anyway, so Dennis got, what happened was those kids destroyed it. They had, you know, a whole bunch of dogs on the house, and th the house was in such bad shape, you couldn't sell it to anybody, you couldn't give it to anybody. I mean, it was just, gave trash a whole new meaning, okay? Whole new meaning to the word trash. It was the way those people treated the house, and the parents were so upset, they couldn't go in it. They just couldn't even face it. So basically, um, and then they had a bunch of water damage uh, from a flood where the water pipes froze and broke. So in that particular case, they not only gave my brother the house, but they paid the real estate commission, and um, which there was one, you know, because one of our real estate friends uh, helped us get that. That was one of our real estate friends. She looked a little bit like Jessica Rabbit, only like a real person with fake boobs and she was, she was such a character, okay? Won't mention her name because she may still be living, though she'll be in her 80s if she is. But anyway, um, we bought this, and they, and they, not only did they give my brother the house, but we got them to make the insurance claim, because they didn't know you could do that. We got them to make the insurance claim on the property, and he got the money from the insurance to fix up the whole house and then rent it out. So that was kind of, you know, this was, you know. Um, so we spent, you know, looking for houses, either through the realtor or going to foreclosure auctions. And George spent a tremendous amount of time down at City Hall looking for, for properties, okay? And um, uh, the... Um, so anyway, my brother was happy fi fixing up his house, and like I say, we had a bunch of pr properties, and we ended up with this sort of big work truck, and um, it had everything almost like a hardware store inside, so that whenever George went to fix the properties, uh, you know, he always hired like teenage kids to work for him, you know, and somebody would work cheap. He never wanted to pay anybody, but um, mostly he was, you know, fixing them up, and then we were, we were renting them out, okay? And... Um, so that was my job. I, my job was to find the rentals and rent the houses out to people and uh, advertise them. And, and then and George was supposed to fix them up. That, that was how the, this was how the division of labor worked. And we didn't get all the houses that we bid on, but we got quite a few. And they were all over. They were from South Houston clear up to Hockley. I mean... Almost, I mean, they were everywhere. There was a lot of driving involved and, and a lot of fixing up. And then as we rented them out, um, uh, as I, I think, you know, we had mortgages on them, but they were very cheap. Most of these houses cost us maybe twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a piece, okay? For a whole house. For a whole house, yeah, okay? So I can remember writing mortgage checks for the for about twenty five thousand dollars a month that we had to collect and rent that counted our house that we were living in, which is slightly nicer. Okay. 
And um, and then, of course, on the others, we had to, you know, the ones we owned in full, we had to have the property taxes and all that stuff. So um, there was a lot, you know, there's, people don't appreciate it, but there's a lot of work involved in rental properties. And there was for us, too. And sometimes, you know, and George would come home you know, really exhausted from all of that, right? From working all day and driving down to Missouri City or wherever the houses were, and then I'd be renting them out. And um, I, 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 I have it's just we had a a list of you know um, good tenants and bad tenants, right? It, it was a learning curve. We know the first thing about rental properties or how to do that, and um, we just didn't. We just really had no. We just were clueless about that so we kind of learned the hard way I remember that we um, we got into some investment groups down in Houston we'd go to and stuff and we met a, a guy who had like a hundred rental properties in Kansas City and he came down and we were somehow we got to know him and um, and I said boy I don't know about this rental property stuff I have no idea how we're going to do any of this right and I, he had such good advice for me he said he says, remember, in any relationship, whether it's a rental p property or marriage or, you know, your kids or whatever, they're either, you're either training them or they're training you. And if you want to run all over the world trying to chase your money every month because nobody wants to pay you, because they, they want to pay, buy, pay for their new television and not your rent, he says, fine, and if you don't want to do that, the first time someone doesn't pay, send out a foreclosure notice and eviction notice and kick them out. And it's amazing how fast that uh, you, you want to be the priority, not them, okay? So, That's pretty you know, good advice. Well, it was good advice. It really was a good advice for anybody for anything, really. I mean, um, I mean, it's kind of, kind of funny that way, but yeah, it's good advice. So, anyhow, um, uh, let's see where... Where am I painting here? I'm over here. Okay, I'm right here. I'm doing two different scenes at the same time because these are little and they're totally different. So I'm constantly switching images, figuring out which ones I'm doing. And if you're confused, probably not as confused as me. What do you think of that? <laughs> so I don't know. You make it look very easy. So anyway, um, so then, so what happened was I discovered that it, George didn't, you know, we could only have so many vacancies a month, and he didn't have time. If everybody left, or didn't, if you kicked everybody out and they didn't have, if you couldn't figure out a way to get people to pay the rent, um, he could only fix up so many houses at the same time. So my job, besides renting out the properties, was to make sure that the tenants didn't leave. Does that make sense? You know, I, they need, they, they'd get in a fight with their, whoever they were living with, and then they, they're going to move out or... You know, um, and so, you know, I, I literally almost became a marriage counselor, uh, very selfish on my part, but that's, you know. Um, and it was really interesting because, I mean, I had such funny, I had such funny, and people are funny, right? Um, and I had all, you know, all, you know, I had, a, you know, um, most of our houses were, you know, a $30,000 house. The, the, the people were, the people I rented to were struggling. Does that make sense? They could pay their rent, but it was a struggle. Kasia had some good people. In fact, well, I had some people out there in, in out in Sugarland, and they had rented a house for me, and they had fixed it up so much when I drove by, I didn't even recognize it. They were so excited because they had done all this stuff. But mostly, I had people that didn't do that. For instance, uh, when we finally moved out to another house and moved out of the Kingwood house, um, I rented to a dentist and he hipped his dog in the garage and his dog ate through the drywall in the garage in one of the other rooms. Um, there wasn't enough pet deposit in the world to cover the junk that dog was doing, I gotta tell you. And um, so we had, you know, we had the, the dog and the pet issue, 
And, um, uh, yeah, dog and pet issue, that was for sure, you know, that was a problem. And so you take a pet deposit, but the pet deposit didn't do diddly squat, right? So uh, years later, I, just, I had a good friend of mine. She moved in and still is a good friend. She'd moved to Texas from Guam. And um, she had bought, we helped her buy a house on foreclosure too. Some of the last ones you could get. She actually assumed a VA. A lot of times you could assume a VA loan for somebody because they were assumable loans. So you didn't have to buy them. You could just assume their loan, maybe give people a little cash and they'd leave. So um, anyway, so she got this house and this V and so it, and in Georgia helped her get it, you know, too. You know, we'd all helped her get it, and so she was fixing it up, and her mom was with with her. And the first thing she did was go out and get a dog. And it's so funny because she lived with us a little bit before she went and got the dog. I mean, we bought the house, right? And she knew how George felt about pets, right? Just because of his experiences with the rental properties, right? So she absolutely knew how we felt about him. And so she, he'd come over and she'd hide the dog from him. She'd pretend like she didn't have a dog. Even though he, we didn't own the house, it was her house, it didn't matter what kind of dog she had, why would we care what kind of dog she had? But she, was, she didn't want to hear about, about the fact that he thought her having a dog was a bad thing. I mean, you know, that's some influence, friends, you know? <laughs> Just I remember her picking up all the dog toys and she said, I don't want... I don't want George to know I have this dog. And I was like, but it's your house. I know, but I just don't want to have. She says, I don't want the conversation. And it's so funny because years later, she married a man who also had rental properties and felt just like George did about dogs, right? <laughs> just the same way, right? And um, it was a very hard adjustment for him to, to have her move, you know, because she's always had dogs and horses and pets. I mean, she just has them and she's having them and that's just how it is. But for the most part, as landlords, we were not real big on dogs. And then the next thing we bought is besides the, the 35 uh, VA, we had those houses. And then we had, we bought some condominiums. Now this was sort of interesting because there was this whole condominium complex and they had been very expensive when they first went. And, the whole condominium project um, had gone downhill fast. And so it was from foreclosure. And our realtor, the one that found us, the VA homes, uh, found us that those two. And we, we um, in that case, they weren't in foreclosure. With a, a bank owned them. And they had originally sold for like $80,000 to $110,000 apiece. They were one and two bedroom condos, two story and some single story. And um, so George bid um, $5,000, I think was the most we ever paid for one of those condos. But seriously. And the realtor was so upset. He said, you can't bid $5,000 for that. No one's going to take it. John said, George, remember George saying, well, listen, that's okay if you don't want to do it, but that's my bid. I'll get someone else to put the bid in. If you don't want to do it, I'll find another realtor, but that's the bid I want you to put in. And sure enough, we got them for the $5,000 a piece and then fixed them up and rented them out, okay? So they were, they were a, a good deal, do you think? And <laughs> just, in fact, it was really funny. We had a guy that worked for us. And, it, you know, one of the guys that worked for us, one of the adults that George hired, a, you know, a guy in his 30s that had come down and to Texas from California, I think. And he was, um, he was working, for, working for us and helping us fix, fix up the properties. And I remember him saying one time to George, he said he was looking at this plastic faucet George had bought to put in one of the rental properties. He said, and it was, I think it was like 5 or $6, he said, if they sold it, if they sold a $2 plastic faucet, would you have bought that instead? George says, yeah, probably, you know. That's, George, George was cheap. And, um, uh, well, that's not a terrible quality on a person, exactly. Depends on what he's being cheap about. Sometimes you can be penny wise and pound foolish, you know. I remember my friend Didi from Bulgaria, her father had, I thought, a very wise saying. He had told her when she was a kid, 
we're not rich enough to buy cheap stuff. And, uh, but not everybody has that uh, upbringing. You have to understand, when George was growing up in um, California, his father was a, you know, a master sergeant in the Marine Corps. They had five kids, and there was never enough money. Absolutely never enough money. So they, you know, they just, um, if he, kids wanted to go to the movies, um, his dad would um, go down to the junkyard, uh, you know, find a bunch of junk that they were throwing out and then have them take it down to the junkyard down the street and sell it so the kids could go to the movies, okay? That's what, you know, kind of what he did. So if you can appreciate that, um, um, that, you know, we came from different backgrounds. I came from a family where we never thought about the cost of anything. And George came from a family where you always thought about the cost of anything. So it was an interesting <laughs> dichotomy because we had such a different viewpoint on stuff. And, you know, people do think, you know, you talk about money. People do think differently about money. I, those are one of those discussions you ought to have before you marry somebody. I mean, I'm not, I mean, that just all, all those things, you know, what do you think about that stuff? Because... Uh, again, different viewpoints. My friend, my friend that um, with the dog, um, she one time said to me, she was buying something and she never bought anything on sale because she didn't want people. She wanted only nice stuff. And it, she uh, she married a guy very much like George that would, you know, would, would we'd go dumpster diving right for free stuff. Okay, and I it's, I just think my friend. The idea of dumpster diving for anything is so abhorrent to her. And the first time, I remember they had gotten married in their 60s. We we're all good friends. But the first time um, her husband brought home some neat thing from, you know, he'd found somebody had thrown out dumpster diving. She was just horrified. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you talking about, right? And, and you know, one of the things George and I would do, we would... Um, you, the, some of the best dumper, dumpster diving is out is in a strip mall out, out from an office office depot or something, because when people return things, the the, the help you know doesn't want to um, put it back on the shelf or do all the paperwork to return it. So for them, it's just easy. They throw it in the dumpster or they throw it in the dumpster to retrieve it later. Okay. We've gotten, we got, used to go get some amazing stuff, dumpster diving, and of course, um, you know, he was all, always about the deal. Does that make sense? Always about the deal. So, uh, anyway, we had these, you know, rental properties, and um, uh, we did manage to take a few vacations and stuff like that, but mostly, you know, it was every day we were doing something with that. I wasn't doing a lot of painting in those days uh, because there was just too much involved uh, in what we were doing. I, um, I just that kind of went out the window, literally painting because of the um, uh, just it just wasn't practical. Uh, I had I might have done no, just really just didn't do any painting. Okay, so anyhow. Um, back to money and dumpster diving and rental properties. So in order to, eviction laws are different in every state, okay? But in order to get somebody, if somebody isn't paying and you finally get to the point where you have to evict them, um, let's see, let's get a little more color in that. You've got to go to, you, you send them the letters and then you've got to go to court. And, um, and depending on where the house is, they're all over the place. You know, there, there were some up in Spring, there were some down in Murray City. The, the, the court offices were everywhere. So you had to, you know, so sometimes you had to get up very early in the morning to make a court date because then you had to, you know, be, appear, appear, appear before the, a judge and get him to approve the eviction, okay? And I can remember, uh, I had taken, I had to take, 
I had to do something that morning that required, I know I got up very early to take cinnamon somewhere. I had to do something else. And um, I can remember getting down to uh, Missouri City and I was just wearing shorts and um, got in the courtroom and the judge told, you know, told me I had to leave, that he would not hear the case because I was wearing shorts. I was disrespectful, even though, you know, that whole thing, you know, we wouldn't even go there. But I mean, I, I was just, what? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Really? You're not going to hear this because I'm wearing shorts? But that was, a, you know, kind of those lessons that you, you learn. And uh, that you don't think you know you don't think that much about, but then you find out that it matters to somebody, okay? And uh, a matter to him, obviously. So um, anyhow, that was the um, uh, mostly. I would, you know, if I went, if you had to go to court, you had to be dressed up a little bit. So small little trivial things, you know, but you did. And so mo mostly, though, people would, one of the ways that people would pay, the, pay their rent, okay, was we had a couple of ways. We had something called Section 8 tenants. And Section 8 tenants uh, get their rent, rent paid by the federal government. And you have to be on a waiting list. And, um, and if it's a Section 8 house, you know you're going to get the money because the government pays you. So there's a landlord, they're desirable tenants from that standpoint. And also they have to inspect the property uh, before you, um, uh, you can rent it. Okay? They, have to, they have to come out and make sure that there's light switches and the oven works and the air conditioning works and all this stuff has to work or um, you're not renting anything. Okay. And sometimes if you, if you had to pass inspections and then you had to meet the inspector out there. And George always was, you know, having to meet the inspector. And um, so, uh, but you got, um, for the most part, you got your rent. And um, I remember one tenant and, um, named Glenda. And Glenda had come in there, and she, she had five kids. She, they were sort of living, you know, uh, um, tight, you know what I mean? I mean, things weren't, you know, th things weren't real flush. And I came in, and she had all brand new furniture. And I knew, Honestly, honestly, she had all brand new furniture. I kid you not. Um, and I remember saying to Glenda, because I'd, I'd, I'd go by to collect the rent, because sometimes the Section 8 people would pay so much, and then the tenant would have to pay like 35 or 50 or maybe $150, and, and they'd pay the rest, depending on what they felt their income was and, you know, from, you know, child support or whatever, you know. And so I, I, can, re I can remember uh, talking to Glenda and I'm saying, Glenda, <laughs> Glenda, <laughs> I see you have some lovely new furniture. Did you win the lottery? Something happened? How'd you, I mean, you know, not that anybody couldn't have new furniture, but I just kind of, she was struggling to come up with the rent and um, you know her little 150 or whatever it was she had to pay, but um, so I said, uh, "See, so you had new furniture," and she says, "Oh well," she says, "I've got this deal I do every year," and I'm going, "What's that?" And she said, "Well, you guys get this. This is a great story. <laughs> Just uh, what kind of deal, Glenda?" And she goes, "Well." I have this friend, and um, he has a, He doesn't have any kids, and he makes a lot of money on his job. He makes good money, so I let him use my kid's social security number 
uh, so he can get a big tax refund with the kids, and then I get it too, she says. You following that? So they split the tax refund money every year. That and she sounds said, like a good deal. Well, it's actually fairly clever, really, when you think, because they don't have any way to track it. Because, you know, everybody's, you know, who knows which kid's living with who, and you know what I mean? There was no, there was no incentive for Glenda, Glenda to claim the kids. She wasn't claiming them, you know. She, she didn't want to show any income uh, because then she wouldn't get, um, she wouldn't get social, you know, she wouldn't get, uh, you know, the benefits from um, all this other stuff, right? So that, that's, I said, so she says, oh, yeah, she says, um, everybody knows about that kind of stuff, you know, we, just, we all know that. And um, I said, you know, Glenda, I got to tell you, the most everybody doesn't know that, but that's interesting. She says, well, we know. We know how that's done. I said, okay. Well, I'm not criticizing, you know, I just thought it was interesting. I got my rent because she got, she got her new furniture and, and, um, and um, so talking to Glenda was just always kind of interesting. You can imagine why, right? And let's see what else. Oh, yeah. So we had, that was Glenda, okay? That's some of this tenants. And, you know, I had, we got into kind of a rhythm finally. It took a while to, you know, figure out how to rent property and get it where people paid their rent and, and didn't kind of switch around. And, um, Well, as I'm sitting here doing my little grassy stuff here. So, let's see, let's see. So, I decided that, you know, I had been doing this for a few years, and that what I ought to do is write a book on being a landlord, because I thought I kind of had it down, you guys. A little cocky of me, but I really did think I had it down, how to be a landlord, okay? So, um... We had come back from out of town. I don't know who we were. We had been gone. We came back from out of town, only to see our one of our rental properties on the six o'clock news, and four people had been shot in the garage, killed. Okay. So, you know, the news people tried doing, you know. Um, kind of challenges they, they ended up they found us and tried to interview us about the property and you know how, how was this possible and I said well you know I really don't this is a section 8 house and I got to tell you if there was a problem with this we were not alerted because the government was right out there not last week inspecting it so I don't know but I you know if the government inspectors didn't catch it I don't know why you'd think we would okay <laughs> you know so true. So we had this, um, we had, all our houses were insured. And I had it back in those days when I'd signed up for all these houses, this one, one um, realtor uh, insurance guy down in, uh, down in the city of Houston had um, um, written the policies. And we had, um, had a hundred dollar, we had a hundred dollar deductible on the houses. So if there was an insurance claim, it didn't cost us much to claim it. So we had a, we had found a guy who was an insurance adjuster for people, you know, independent insurance adjuster, but he didn't work for the insurance companies. He worked for you. He worked for you. And we had gotten we had gotten to know him because we had a problem with the with the plumbing on the condos and all the sewer had backed up in one of them and the sewer was bad and it was all bad and it turned out that we called Stan and um, Stan came out and um, 
uh, you know, did a claim and read the policy we had for this, these condominiums and stuff. And uh, he managed to um, get the insurance company to totally redo all the plumbing for the sewage and, and the condominium because we were insured. Where, you know, just something you want to know, right? So we had called him in on this property because the four people had been shot and killed in it. And um, turned out the tenants were, had, were stealing electricity from two horse houses down. They had run a big long cord because they couldn't afford the electricity. House never caught that either. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we, Stan goes in there with this insurance lady from the, from the policy, I think we said State Farm or somebody, and he's going in the garage and she's looking around and kind of complaining about this and that and he's, he told her, he said, she says, well, he says, you might want to have the, you know, the, the garage uh, floor, you know, cleaned, he says. And she says, why would I do that? And she's looking at it. And he says, well, basically you're standing in blood. And uh, <laughs> he said she leaped up about four feet and had to go levitated into the kitchen and didn't want to stay in the house anymore at all. And whatever Stan asked for, she just said, yeah, fine, whatever. You know, yes, yes. <laughs> just never said, you know, cover the whole thing, everything, uh, new roof, everything, and, and paid for the destruction of our house from the... Um, and then we, you know, rented it back out again, okay? <laughs> just... Yeah, so, like I say, I had been gung-ho on um, writing this rental book on how to be a land landlord, and then that happened. And I gotta tell you, that kind of took the wind out of my sails, you know what I mean? I just didn't feel qualified anymore <laughs> to write about rental houses, people, you know, getting shot. And I didn't like being on the 6 o'clock news. That was an experience that I like watching it, but I like to see other people, you know, in that position. Certainly not me. So um, I know it's kind of funny, isn't it? But that's, that's what happened there. So anyhow, uh, we went ahead and rented it out again and with, you know, not too much problem. So Stan, Stan, you know, was a good insurance agent because we often called him because we uh, because of the um, uh, the fact that there was always something, and the, the running joke in in the family was for about me um, if the, on my tombstone she read, read, led a good life and she was insured, you know, <laughs> just. <laughs> Because I remember there's another, another tenant that had moved out of a house. And um, this tenant, this particular tenant, um, had just destroyed the place. I mean, it was bad. And um, George was looking and said, he says, this is going to cost us a lot of money to fix up this one right here. Because, I mean, it was bad. They had just really wrecked it, throwing paint on the walls and, you know, just some, just total. And I says, well, maybe. I said, let me see what I can do. And I called, called Stan and I said, I think we can, we can get the insurance company to pay for this um, under vandalism. Because somebody vandalized the house. I don't think it meant, doesn't specify in the policy who the vandal is, it's just the house was vandalized. You can see it. And sure enough, I was right. They were willing to um, to cover the vandalism. And then some years later, my good a friend of mine, just talking about insurance now for a minute, good friend of mine is a little local art gallery and his wife's twin sister had um, been murdered. And the man that did it was in jail and uh, in some other state. I don't forget which one. And he spent a whole $2 and filed a lawsuit. 
and, uh, and, and because they had gone to his parole hearing, and the family had all gone, and um, claimed that he they didn't feel like it was that he should have been let out in par on parole. All right, and so uh, he sued him. He sued him, and their daughter was getting married, and uh, and it was going to cost just over ten thousand dollars up front just to hire an attorney to even look at it because it was out of state and they had to you know hire somebody to take a good look at this and um, it wasn't a good thing yes and yes um, so I remember telling him I said you know I bet your liability on your homeowner's insurance would cover that and he says why were you saying that Ginger I said, yeah I think so he says, no, no. He says, my cousin sells insurance. He would have told me if that were true. I said, well, I, I said, I think it will. And he, I said, look, at, what's it going to cost you to ask? He says, well, I don't want to put in a claim because you know what happens when you put in claims and they deny him. I says, well, um, I would just feel your broker out and see because I personally think that they would. And... Um, Guess he was right. Eek. They did. They paid. They paid. Not only they they paid for the attorney to go go down there to that other state where that prison was, and um, yeah, that was all. That was all covered by insurance, right? What do you think? Of, you know. So anyhow, just small little things in the life of being a landlord. Stuff you know, you learn. And now, if I were going to give anybody advice about uh, being a landlord, if anybody has rental properties, I've got good advices now, right? What was my friend? Uh, my friend Dee Dee always used to call it advices. You've got any advices, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Not vices, advices. I said, oh, sure, Dee Dee. Yeah, Ginger always has advices. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, um, if you're going to rent out something, you want, of course you want to do a credit check, and you want to visit their last landlord, and if you can, if they live in the area, do a surprise visit, knock on the door, and just say you just had a couple questions, and peek around and see how they're living there. Okay? That's a good indication of how they're going to live in your house. Just saying, right? So, there's some advices there. And, um, The other thing I'll see, I'd probably say is um, um, imagine the kind of tenant that you want before you rent. Imagine the person, kind of what we call, you know, kind of prepave, prepave the kind of person you want living in your house. Imagine this lovely person that's going to pay their rent on time, spend about 10 or 15 minutes sitting down writing the qualities that you would like to see in a tenant tell the universe that's what you would like that you don't want potluck really you can do that for anything um, unfortunately um, I know these things and don't always practice what I preach um, we're having a, our dishwasher after 15 years finally failed and um, we got the, we went ahead and just like the other day, we ordered online another dishwasher and it was supposed to be installed yesterday. We got it from Best Buy thinking that, because we'd already had some, not, not a great experience with Lowe's and the price was the same. We thought, well, okay, we'll just, we'll, um, we'll just buy it from Best Buy because we bought other stuff from them. But really all we'd bought from them was cameras and televisions. So, did yeah, we buy we anything? Well, we got the refrigerator from them and the stove. Yeah, but the stove you had to install because it was during COVID. And the refrigerator, yes, yeah, pretty good. The refrigerator people, pretty good. But other than that, but, you know. So um, they were supposed to come at 3 o'clock yesterday. That's why we didn't have a show yesterday. They were supposed to come at 3 and then 4. And then finally, finally about 5 o'clock, John calls. 
and says, where, where is everybody? And um, Well, they have until 6 o'clock. They have until 6 o'clock. But the guy said, well, they came and rang the doorbell, and nobody was home. And they left. And, you know, we were working with our computers in the office right downstairs, right where the front door is, you know, like, you know, steps not very far, away. you know, just, you know, steps away. And you can hear the doorbell. Plus, we have a, a, a camera security. And I can tell you right now, nobody rang our do doorbell or came up. We have the, the footage of the whole afternoon. Nobody showed up. And they the guy sat there and lied to us, which is extremely upsetting. But they don't understand that one of the things that um, uh, about having your own YouTube channel is you can throw companies like this under the bus because we would never. They're still they have tell they're supposed to come out and redo Friday and if they don't then we'll cancel the order and move on right. But um, we would not recommend them because of the fact not you know anything can have a problem not because they didn't come right. No, um, call and tell me the truth. Th th but to have somebody lie to us on the phone, use Google Earth to describe my front door, and then tell me that, well, they came and you screw guys screwed up and nobody's coming because you guys are idiots or something along that line, right? Okay. Uh, that doesn't fly, does it? Nope. Unless they were invisible and my camera didn't pick them up. Um, yeah, so... Again, uh, you know, if we, you know, I, it's my fault too. I didn't spend just what I told you about a tenant. I should have spent a little time imagining the people coming. One thing we try to imagine is good service. So perhaps we wouldn't have got it with those people, which is why they didn't come, because we wanted good service. And, you know, those are the people that thought that particular, you know, a lot of different groups installed dishwashers. They hire from different contractors. So, um, you know, we could go there with that, right? But I have to say that um, uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing like a little pre-paving on stuff um, when you're, um, um, before you have something done, yes? So this has all been done with one little brush, hasn't it? Let's see other make it one. nice when you clean up. Yeah, just looking for my other little one. Okay, where are you? Here. If any, I always like to. This is a master stroke, pro small. Let me put my brush on it. Pro Art Series 651 Soft Blender. This was a my good friend Kim Carr gave this to me. Um, I like it because it's little. I can't remember what I was going to do with it, but I do like it. Okay, here, it's coming back to me now. Okay? So, anyhow, having said that, we'll just, we'll keep you guys posted on the dishwasher saga. Um, another story. Just another story. And the thing of it is, is that, you know, it's a short, so the thing of it is, it's a small world, okay? You can't get away with anything because people have cameras, and they, um, you can't just sit there and lie. Oh, yeah, we came. Well, that might be, have worked, you know, 100 years ago before there was cameras, right? But it doesn't work now. It doesn't work now, does it? No. So, um, anyhow, and also that people talk. You don't have to have a YouTube show to talk. Everybody talks, and then they, they post stuff. And, and um they take pictures and they post and, you know, you're just not going to get away with, with stuff like you used to, you know, before the internet and ca instant cameras and um, you just aren't. Um, but back then, um, when I was having rental houses, let's see. Need a little paint gray. A little bit of a dark color here. Just put it here. Um, we, we had some of the first cell phones. When we first started, there were no cell phones. 
well, there were big, heavy things in the case, and they were like like a thousand dollars for a cell phone, which is, you know, it's a huge amount of money. And um, th there just weren't any, right? And um, just gonna use this little stuff. So we had these. We each had a cell phone, and. Um, I remember we had gone, George was down in Missouri City uh, fixing up a rental property and um, his cell phone was sitting on the back of his truck and some kids stole it. And that was, you know, this, that's, there was no, gee, we, you lost your, insur your cell phone, we're so sorry the insurance company's going to pay for it. Then have cell phone insurance, then you just got the cell phone and that's all you got, right? And George called the police, and they came out. You know, nowadays, I don't think they would, but back then, they came out, and they went, apparently, when they stole the cell phone. <laughs> Sorry, it's funny. When they stole the cell phone, they, um, they were eating potato chips and sodas, and the police just followed the, the breadcrumbs and bags to where they were with the cell phone. They just chased, you know, followed the, the trail of crumbs, literally, of the, <laughs> of the, what these kids were eating, and then and got our cell phone back, which was lovely, you know, because you, who doesn't, you know, that was a good thing, right? So anyway, that just thought that was funny. They just chased all the pop, pop and soda cans and all the stuff these kids had, and That, so anyway, that was the story of the cell phones and the and let's see tenants that we had that were interesting. Um, trying to think, we just well, I remember we had this one lady and she was on Section Eight housing, and um, she had just moved in, and she had called me up because. She was very worried about um, the fact that um, she was good, that when they were they just they're just moving in and she had this extremely concerned about this um, uh, hole she had in the ceiling and that was that if she, if she referred to as an itty bitty hole in the ceiling and was I likely to charge her for that okay and. I said, well, you know, I mean, George is busy, you know, and he's barely getting him out there to all these things, right? So, and she said it was an itty bitty hole, and being the kind of landlord I am, I said, well, can you just stuff a sock in it? I mean, you know, <laughs> just kind of thing, right? And she goes, no, she said she couldn't, couldn't stuff a sock in it. I gotta dry you guys. So I'll tell you what happened with the bitty bitty hole in the ceiling. So anyway, George drove down his truck, down to Missouri City in his truck, and um, her hole, her husband had gone up into the attic, I don't know, to maybe try to store something, right? And he had fallen through, and you could have put a Volkswagen car <laughs> through the hole in her itty bitty well, it's just an ceiling. itty bitty hole. You know, <laughs> she could have put a Volkswagen in it. It was unbelievable, right? And that's that's the, 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 the those are some of the things that we would run into, you know, being this land, being landlords. And we had another tenant, tenant and says, my air conditioning is not working. I don't know what the deal is. It's running, but it's not cool in the house. So um, George went out there, and sure enough, the air conditioning was running just fine. 
though working pretty hard, and it turned out she had a window open. <laughs> yeah, one of her little windows was open, and that was the end of the you know, air conditioning not working. Let's see, we had I'm trying to think there's really some kind of fun fun stories here. Uh, well it depends a definition of fun, but they were all different. And we always had we hired a the people that we that worked for us were just an interesting group. They came and they got well there were some kids, when we were still in the Kingwood house, there were some kids that lived in the neighborhood, and they worked with, um, with uh, you know, like high school kids. And the thing is that, that he, George taught them how to lay carpet and how to do air conditioning, because they did it all, okay? They did it all. And he taught them all that stuff. So, you know, it's, if you want to, you know, set tile or... Whatever it was that these houses, the plumbing, you know, he had it. Now, George had had his contractor's license in California, so he did know a few things about how to do stuff together. Um, it didn't really translate into what he did in our house, but he did know how to do some <laughs> of that stuff, right? John, wouldn't you say that's a true you, statement, that, that's, John? That's a very valid way to do it. You know, it didn't really translate into to my house, but, they, you know. Anyhow, so they'd gone down to Missouri City, to work on some houses and, you know, all these fun little neighborhoods. And the, um, the kids, the kids that were with them said that they had found these abandoned puppies. And just cute as a button and they, they wanted to take them home. Cause they were just wonderful. Now, the thing of it is, is that I know from experience that you just can't show up with dogs. That most parents, you just don't show up with a dog. It generally doesn't work that way. You know what I mean? Guess what I found? Follow me home, kind of thing. You know, that kind of works, but it really kind of doesn't. You know, it just that's only in fiction does that work. So these two boys came home with their dogs, but I was surprised. They're apparently these were pretty fancy pedigreed pu puppies that they had managed to acquire. And um, their parents weren't unhappy about it. They thought they were going to let them keep them. And then we started getting some my right phone calls. And apparently, while they were working with George on the one house, they had climbed the fence on the neighbor's yard, seen the puppies, and stolen them. Seriously. So the... Um, uh, parents, their parents intervened, and I mean, we, you know, we told their parents, and you know, by the way, these kids, that, these marvelous dogs that you guys have, that your kids just stole them. But just we have to give, we have to get the back. We have to, we don't want our houses vandalized in that na neighborhood because your kids stole some dogs, right? Some puppies, and um, anyway, so they took the dogs back. And I don't think they worked a lot longer for us because they had kind of different idea about what was other people's property. And apparently they hadn't learned that at home. My being a little facetious here, but um, anyway, they hadn't. So, and then, then in order for them to, for him to, you know, keep the cross down, I mean, we, we had, you know, people that normally were pretty good at their job, but maybe alcoholics or something, and they couldn't get real work somewhere else, so they had to put up with us. And, um, I think I may have mentioned the story about the squirrel eater, right, John? Well, who? The, the squirrel eater. No. Back, back on our house in Kingwood, the, um, the uh, balcony had, was collapsing. 
so they had to put in, George had to put in a new, they were building a new balcony. And one of these guys, um, really, if you've seen the movie Deliverance, um, that was them. <laughs> Honestly, God, I, I'm not making this up. I'm not being mean or anything. That's them, these two guys. And drunk all the time and, you know, um, just, you know, all paychecks went to a party on the weekend kind of thing, right? And anyhow, so the upshot of it was that we were sitting there in one of the, in these big tall pine trees in our backyard, and one of the guys just, he took up a, a, uh, a screwdriver and he threw it up into the air and um, knocked the squirrel out of the tree, killed it, and skinned it, and said, that's dinner. And I, after that, he was referred to as the squirrel eater. And that was the kind of, you know, kind of unreliable people George took. Um, you know, it, it ended up hiring. So let's see what else did we have going here with the rentals. Well, change change pictures for a while now. Let's see, I've still got some zinc white. This is sort of fun doing two of them because I don't have to dry that much. That can be drying when I'm doing another one, right? Um, okay. All right, so I'm just going to kind of scoot over this way. Uh, you know, I was looking for CAD Gentle Light, John, and... Um, we have it because you put it there exactly where you said you were going to put it. Did I? Yes, ma'am. Well, I have this, but it's not CAD Jello, It's a light. Well, let me help you because... Well, if, you see, if you see it, because I didn't see it. If you see it, that would be just Marvy. If anybody said that. Everybody um, says Marvy. This says cadmium yellow light. Cadmium yellow light. Do you want cadmium yellow light? Yes. The one that says cadmium yellow light? The one, the one that says cadmium yellow light. That's the one I want. Well, there you go then. That's exactly what I want. If you put it exactly where you said you were going to put it. Did I? Well, it should go in this one there. Well, no, that's not what you wanted before. Well, I lied. So now you're changing the rules. I lied. <laughs> so now you have to relearn where it is. So okay. when you go looking for it, well, you can't was a find spare. it. That's not a spare anymore. The other, I guess, I used up. Because that was the spare. So you got to keep up with this stuff. That was the spare. Well, you have hands of yellow light. Maybe you should move that up instead. Yeah. So you don't grab it by mistake. Here's your okay. cadmium yellow light, your original one that's not fully used yet. So you shouldn't have gone into the Well, I was yet. looking for that. Oh, I just goodness. didn't see it. If I was looking for that, sure. well, John, and I you, just I'm didn't see it. I'm going to have to cut it. you off here. That's all there is to it. Um, I try to get you organized. Oh. You don't want to use that word around me, do you? Don't, what, organized? Doesn't... No, cut off, right? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably don't want, want to start conversations with that, do you? I'm just saying. I, I, I just venture to say that I would imagine that wouldn't be productive. Anyhow, so let's see, back to, you know, renting the houses. The worst was the condominiums. They rented very well. I will say the condominiums really did rent well. You know, somebody always wants to live in the condominium, and we, you know, they 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 didn't want. And I I got on the board of the condominium association because I wanted to protect our, protect the investment. And uh, because there was you know there was a lot of. Um, uh, let's see. When you have, you know, not only you have to rent them, but there's just, there was a lot of maintenance and stuff, and I, I didn't want to get hit. When you own a condominium, for instance, we were looking, before we moved to California, from Texas, from California, George and I were looking at a really neat condominium project in Carlsbad, California. 
And what was neat about that one was the, um, it, it was gorgeous. It had, it looked like Disney had built it, okay? But they had the uh, power, if they needed a new roof, you could then be assessed, let's say $5,000. That's how most condominiums work. And then you gotta pay that. Even if you don't happen to have a spare $5,000 now, because your association dues are supposed to protect you from all that, but they don't necessarily, okay? So, um, when we had the condominium, I wanted to be on the board of the condominium because uh, I wanted to make sure that we didn't get that we had enough money in the kitty where we didn't get hammered with some unexpected bill because we had a lot of condos, eight or nine, and then uh, George's mom had some which we were also renting out for her. She bought three, and I think Dennis bought a couple. Yeah, he bought some too, okay? Um, uh, and then, so, let's see, condominium dues, why we bought them. Let's see, where are we going with that, John? I'm still thinking like three things at the same time. I'm not sure on that one. Say so something about, oh, yeah, it's a problem with buying condos, right? Mm. Is that, that, again, so I wanted to be on the board so I could at least protect it. But the problem we discovered is it's like no matter what you do, someone isn't liking it. There's somebody in the group that you does not like what everybody. you've done. You can't please, and really, and, and, and cause problems. And, no matter, and uh, honestly, we were probably the best people you'd want on the board because we didn't want to spend any more money than we have to. And if we had to raise the dues, trust me, only because we, they weren't covering the insurance. And when the condominiums became mostly rentals for people, there were some people that lived there full time, but when they became for rentals, it was very hard to get insurance. The insurance costs absolutely uh, skyrocketed for the insurance costs on these things. So we ended up, uh, you know, on the board. But I just remember that was probably just being so un, just truly unhappy. I don't know if depressed is the right right word, but no matter what you did, you just couldn't. You just you just couldn't couldn't get it. Just no matter what you did, it didn't matter. They just nobody cared. They somebody was always mad about something. And it's you know it's it's a little bit of a challenge being a landlord anybody anyway, and then to have everybody else just kind of whining and and it seems like we were always in meetings with everybody else and about this and that and so it was a it was a it was a hassle. Uh, so I. I would personally, I told John, I said, even if I, if we retired, I wouldn't recommend condominium kind of living only in the sect that, uh, well, my friend Judy, she lives in Kentucky in a condominium. Kind of she was the president for a while. She, she'll tell you, too. They were just, um, so she's on it's today. It's a thankless okay. job. It's, it's a crummy, it's a thankless job. Nobody gives a rip. And, you know, all they, all they do is complain. I know that's a brash statement, but really that's... That's very brash. That, that's what it feels like to me, okay? Yeah. So... Uh, that's pretty much complainers. Um, that's, 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 you know, people, you know, nothing was ever good enough. Go to these board meetings and they were never, no one was ever happy. And the longer we had rentals, the more I realized that, well, it's true that that's what they call passive income. And for the most part, if you have good tenants, that can work really well for people, okay? But... I don't believe I'd ever want to do it again. You know, having done it that one time, just don't think I'd, I'd want to do it. So eventually we sold all the houses to one investor. 
but that's another story for another another day on that, right? Just trying to get a deep. So you kind of got out of the. Uh... Yeah, we we did. We we finally got out of the um, the the rental business as it was, the real estate re rental business. Because, honestly, the, the housing thing, I remember the housing was the most interesting thing. Um, th there was a couple of ways, when people were having trouble paying their rent, they had a couple of options that they could do. And, of course, United Way would um, pick up somebody's rent or a gas bill or electric bill once a year. So if somebody, And they may still do it. So, they would do that. And then um, there was a church called Katie's Christian Ministries, and then there was a, another Southwest Christian Ministries where the churches in Texas, they would all get together in the area, and they would combine their, their, their funds. And I don't know who was in charge, but somebody, obviously. And they would pay somebody's rent. So, um, if so, if you the, if if they asked ahead of time, and you had to get to them uh, pretty fast, because they only had so much month money every month that they gave out. And so, if you wanted them, if you wanted their assistance. You had to ask them right away. And they generally wanted to see an eviction notice. So if the tenant wanted um, to get help from the government, you know, from the, these, this, like these churches, they wanted to see an ev eviction notice. But I remember one ten tenant I had, they, his car broke down, and they, they gave him the repairs for a car, you know, to get his car fixed. Kind of a one-time deal, not a loan. They give it to him. So, I mean, that was kind of nice, right? Um, so people could get could get money that way, and um, there were some other programs at the time, but they they it they came and went. Uh, sometimes th th these programs were there, and then sometimes they just weren't. So you couldn't really uh, count on uh, these others. But the, the the United Way, you know, they were there for a, you know, like a Christmas dinner. Or a turkey, or big, big on giving out turkeys. And most of the people that I talked to, a lot of people that you know had businesses and you know worked for big, large companies in the Texas area. And the companies all, um, well, heck, that happened to me when I was in uh, California. That uh, they felt that United Way was a good charity, and so therefore they would they would pressure you into taking money out of your paycheck to um, to give to United Way. And whether you wanted to do it or not, okay? You couldn't just say, if you didn't give to United Way, you wouldn't get that promotion. Something bad would happen. Um, <laughs> I know, this is shocking, but this was what, you know, this was a lot of, a lot of people were almost, I hate to use the word blackmail, but that's really what it was, you know? You kind of blackmailed into not, into, um, um, into not, um, Um, into into not you know having that taken right out of their paycheck. So United Way always had funds, and I think they probably do across the country. So, you know, it, every every state has things that um, that they do, and um, I know California was big on the United Way. Um, hard to know about these things, but you know, pretty much think that was it, that was it. Okay. So we had ten, 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 so when somebody told me that they couldn't pay the rent, if they just, you know, the, I would always give them the resources. Now, in all fairness, there were certain churches in Texas where the congregations all seemed to know who paid what. Word got around. I found that uh, depending on the neighborhood, a lot of people didn't know, but I had this one lady and her husband was 
dying of cancer and just slowly uh, well you know and and they were renting a house for me and she could not get the rent most months but she would ask a different church every month she had a different church give her money to to pay her rent she got it and they would they, they gave it to her so it might be fifty dollars from one place and a hundred never I never kicked her out never kicked her out because I knew that no matter what she would get it and um, which is impressive in, indeed right and years later she says you know when he dies she says I don't know what I'm gonna do she says I'm really not good at anything and I said lady you're, you you just ought to get in a place where somebody wants you to collect money because you are great at that. That's a skill. You got it. But anyway, um, uh, she, she, had, she, she and her husband, they had the rent paid every month. And then finally, she, and I tried to get her on housing. I said, you've got to get on housing. Apply for housing. And finally, um, she just... Um, I said, look, you may have to, like, write your senator or something. You've got to write somebody to try to get on housing, okay? You've got you to do that. And she did. She finally wrote her senator or somebody, representative congressman or somebody, explained the circumstances, and I put in a letter, and then she got on, okay? Which is kind of nice, isn't it, do you think, that she finally that she finally got onto it, right? But for the most part, I would say that um, uh, house, you know, housing was, um, housing's available. There, there are lots of programs available depending on the area that people live. And um, a lot of times the local churches know. You know, I always thought the post office ought to post stuff like that because they always want to post the most wanted. Well, the most wanted things that people want or you know maybe they're rent paid or something and, and and need some help and the biggest thing is that um, people don't know where to go. Does that make sense, John? Just Absolutely. people don't know where to go. And that's that's the sad thing is that they um, they just don't. And I've got another color, color of green I want. Here it is. The lid fell off of this, oh well. I think I can put a stick. Well, let's just try this green right here. I don't have to put a lot out. Just try that with some of this what I've got. But we now they've got stuff called GoFundMe, and you see that. But back then, besides the fact there were no cell phones and um, computers were at the infancy and um, that kind of stuff, we people that needed let's, let's put that over there that needed help with their rent, um, you could get it, but um, you, you had to know where to find it. You absolutely had to know where to go. But she she did she eventually did get on the she got on the housing. Uh, and let's see rent. Speaking of rent, uh, that, well I'm going to put some of that green out. Maybe I'll put it up here. Kind of coming to life, aren't they? Slowly but surely. Yeah. Well, you do it two at a time.
These fur brushes are great for grass. So as I sit in here kind of focusing on this for a minute. How many, many, many people here, John, in the live chat? Oh, I'll get about 10. About Just 10. Kidding. Well, the thing with this is since we're getting close to the holidays. We've got 61 right now. We had a high of 70. People are coming and going. They're busy. You know, it's that time of year. It's this the time of year, yeah. We're busy painting. We're busy painting. And... Um, Kim's leaving now. Say goodbye to Kim. Bye, Kim. Yeah, it was just, um, like I say, everybody's doing Christmas right, You're stuff. winding down. You know, it's getting down to D-Day. Yeah, like, yeah, it's getting a lot for the holidays. And, of course, you guys know that we'll be doing a special holiday special on of Christmas. Of course you know that. Well, you may not know that, but, no. you know, we are. But the way you said it. Okay, yes, so. uh, Monday... Uh, Christmas Day, we will be live sometime late afternoon. My daughter, after the the Cinnamon, circle. will be there a little quicker. But she will be doing that. And uh, let's see. little board kind of to move this board up. So see, I'm still thinking about, you know, the, all the times that we were landlords in, in Houston. Just some people just sort of st stand out in your mind because just, of, you know, like the dentist whose dog ate, ate through and and I had, I had one lady, and she had a bunch of kids, and maybe th three daughters, and they were, they were just regular tenants. They were, they weren't on government assistance or anything, but they, they were, just living out there in one of the nicer houses we had out in, um, the area, and she had a, her daughter had a weight issue. And occasionally I'd be, I'd, I'd be chatting with all these people, you know, making sure that everybody was paying their rent and all that stuff, right? So these conversations would, would, would ensue because, um, you know, it would be rent time and people would tell me what their deal was, right? And so she was telling me about her daughter and that how her daughter had just could had gained a lot of weight, 16, and um, she was very disappointed because she'd gone to the doctor about it. You know, they'd, you know, they'd gone to the doctor, and the doctor had told her that um, the solution to the one thing that would help was if they got rid of all the cakes and cookies in the house and just didn't have that. And I remember, I never forgot this quote that she said to me. She said. Let me get this straight. She says, she's fat, and the rest of us are all going to be punished. <laughs> I said, well, you know, there's mothers and there's mothers, isn't there? Right? That, never that. Um, yeah, because you just, yeah, right?
There's some good looking grass there. Thank you. All right, that can be drying. We will go to, well, see, I'll just let that dry before I do anything else. Go over here to grass number two. So, uh, okay, so we really got to change brushes here for a minute. I like landscapes because they, they just pretty much resonate with anybody, don't they, John? Yes. You know, you just... Well, everybody just, likes a landscape. Everybody likes a landscape, yeah? Everybody likes a landscape. You never know how these things come out, but... Let's see. Let's see. Titanium. I feel so organized I can find all the paint. John and I spent all this time cleaning up paint in, in the kitchen in here and putting things where I can reach them when we're filming and all that stuff, right? Organization's key. Yeah, huh? Oh no, these are all from references. I don't recommend anybody paint from their imagination. No. John and I spent I spent all day yesterday waiting for the the guy designing to show up the dish designing paintings all day yesterday. We've only got sixty to do. <laughs> you know, we got like we're, it, the, the list keeps growing. I'm almost ready to cut it off. You know, I'm almost ready to say, well, we reached our limit. Sorry, you didn't <laughs> sign up in time. Ah, oh, you only got a week. Yeah, just yeah. So people still have a chance to get a free original painting from moi. But nonetheless. Yeah, we always have references. Always, always, always. Yeah, I just, you know, I see, a lot of times I'll see on Facebook, someone says, I made this all up. And I said, you can tell, too. Guess what? I can tell. You know, certain things you can make up, you know what I mean? Like, I think you could make up a snowman and things that... Maybe things that you've painted your whole life. It's your whole life you spent, you know, drawing horses or something. I think you could probably make up a horse, but it wouldn't be as good as if you had a reference. You know, it depends on how cartoony you want to make it. Um, just wouldn't, um, wouldn't mat, you know, wouldn't be as good. So... But even though these are diff totally different landscapes, they, um, they're interesting, aren't they? Yes. I swear I've put this color about five times. It gives new meaning to the word acrylic stri darker.
Um, I need to lighten that up. So see, as, as things get dry darker or lighter or something, you know, you kind of see where you have to change something. Um, I'm thinking about Well, the, when my brother Dennis lived with us down there, he was doing the rentals, and then he he decided to quit drinking. And I was very glad about that because, you know, it was ruining his health. And um, very pleased that he decided to do that. And. But it was amazing how annoying he was. He, one of the things my brother would do, so we'd talking about rental property or something like that, I'd have a conversation. He'd say things, he'd start things with, with the word, why? So what do you mean, why? Why? <laughs> so I really thought that that was because of his drinking. Because of what? Because of his drinking, that he mm. had these weird personality that, and, 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 and honestly, it, this sounds very silly, but I gave him a pass on that because he was drinking. But when he sobered up and st st still do it, I just got to, still was doing it, he sobered up, still doing it. But I realized that just that was just him. <laughs> it was just him. And I was just so annoyed. Got to tell you, so annoyed, John. I just couldn't believe that. It's just... So... Anyway, that was just my brother Dennis, but very annoying. Anyhow, but he he was a. I think I told you he was a bit of a troublemaker. That's what you said. How so? Well, you didn't really George, George and I had been that we, when we first came down there. We'd been married about a year, not even that, right? So we were still in the. He was one of those, well, well, you kind of saw him even when we, after the divorce, we still fought, right? He, he, George just had triggers and just, I'm a pretty nice person. He'd open his mouth and then all niceness has left me, okay? I'm no longer a nice person anymore. I'm just mad, right? I go from zero to mad, right? And um, uh, my brother would sit there and talk to me. He says, oh, I'm sorry, you and... George are fighting. He said, you know, I wouldn't put up with that. You know, you, you're a strong woman. You don't need to put up with that st stuff. And, and then he'd turn around and to George, and he'd say the same thing. He actually caused fights between us just to see us argue. <laughs> I mean, it was just really sh crummy, don't you? I mean, you think about it. That's a really crummy, uh, immature thing to do. But again, he d did stuff like that. And, um, so we, neither one of us, we were just learning the computer in those days. And Dennis knew a lot about computers for some reason. We don't know why, I don't remember why, but he was the computer expert in our house at that time, okay? And so he, he would leave notes on the computer that just drove George crazy. He would do some sort of helpful thing and then he'd have a note that, like a pop-up it would flash up and say, Thank God for Uncle Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Is there something know? wrong with that? I thank see nothing God. wrong with that. Thank God for Uncle Dennis. That was his thing. Thank God for Uncle Dennis. Really? Really? Um, really. That's what he did. Um, anyway, just you could count on him doing stuff like that. Just making some greens over here. And yeah, he was a real peach that way. And but you know, I I can I'm sorry, you know, I did like him. Just I I did. It just took me a while to catch on that he was just he was uh, causing all this problem, these problems. And I didn't realize it was uh, him doing it. I mean, I just, he was doing it. And I just, it was such a shock. 
you know, because he was just doing all that. So anyway, uh, he sold his property and moved back to Seattle, where he moved in with his girlfriend, Sandra, who was the sister of my sister's best friend in high school. And my sister, Sandra, was her, my, so it's funny how these are all connected. My brother was dating her and my, and she was like, um, like this best, best friend of her sister, but she hated her sister. She was, the sister was, um, t came along 10 years later and um, Sandra uh, hated her. So, uh, and I remember her coming down to visit when we had moved and Dennis was still living with us. She came down to visit, and then George and I had gone out of town on a trip, and we just left them in the house. And she, and now you guys aren't going to believe this, what she did. It's, it's unbelievable. She went in and found my secret stash of chocolate. No kidding. I kid you not. She did that. And ate it all. No way. Yeah. Way. She did. Ate it all. And never, and didn't replace it. Are you kidding me? No. And it did, you know, she, she drove my car. She, they slept in our bed when they were supposed to use his, his room. And they, um, it was like Goldilocks that invaded our house. You know what I mean? And you just looked, it felt like the three bears there with the stuff. And, um, You know, that, that should have been a clue to my brother, right? She was not the kind of person that... Oh, but one thing that was really good, right? That Sandra and I went shopping, you know, one time. And um, the sales lady asked if she was my mother in front of her. Oh, oh you're her mother? <laughs> I don't know why. Sometimes we take to light and small things, right? Is that your mother? I said, no. No, not my mother. But anyway, sorry. I digress, but it's kind of... Some of it's sort of fun in, in a way, yeah? So... Anyway, Sandra and Dennis... That was their own deal. And it was just all from high school. It's funny that it's funny the people that keep coming into your life. So that's what and, makes life interesting. Well, it does, you know. Uh, you know, that Don Steinbeck, or was it, I think, said you can never go home again? Well, that's true. Uh, but you got to, can't really. You can't. So. Now, I'm going to dry this real quick and plant the rest of the grass and flowers and try to wrap this up. For those of us that have joined us late and don't know what this is all about besides the story time. <laughs> if you're wondering why we're sitting here just chit-chatting. Telling you that, you know, the, the, the perils of, let's see, that we didn't quite 
cover that. <coughs> so, a little bit of a cough here. What I'm going to do now is change water, and John has given me a brand new water, which is nice because um, my water's all dirty and I want to do kind of lighter grass and flowers. So I'm going to move to the new water. See how convenient that is? Yeah, that's really... What a clever idea. It was. We're Thank you. It was one people. of mine, but, I, but you're welcome. It was nice. I yeah, like it. You were yeah. brilliant. I was. Because brilliance happens in this room. Brilliance happens in this room, yeah, absolutely. So... This sounds like it might be quick, it may not be, but it takes a little bit to put in the flowers. It's always fun when you're putting in all the different colored grasses and everything. This is what kind of makes the painting. So would I want to be a landlord again? No, I don't think so. I think that I like the piece of, um, not being that. Do you know where the little frames are, John, for these? Yes. Well, we might want to talk You're about that. You're not close enough to doing that yet. Well, maybe not, but just, he says I'm, he knows. Yeah, right there. Right, moment's notice. Bam. I got it. Okay. Don't you worry about that. He says he knows, so we're just going to take his word for it, you guys. I but that, the thing about when we were doing that, I think about it, you're talking about, was I doing any painting? No. Even though I've been an artist my whole life, they're just, um, just didn't. And uh, I had, when I finally moved out of the Kingwood house, I got my first art studio in one of the guest bedrooms. <clears throat> now, the studio that I'm in right now, um, it's, it's a, it's a three-car garage. It's above a three-car garage. We're not in a garage. We're not in the garage, but it's, a, it's above the three-car garage, exactly so. Yeah. And... Um, Yeah, we're, we're, we're above the three-car garage, but um, I'm trying to use all this, this paint up. Oh, so I have to put some out. Okay. But back when I was still doing rental houses and stuff, we had this uh, this um, office over our three-car garage, and um, in order to furnish it, we actually went to an auction. They were having a lot of auctions in Houston in those days. And we went into uh, this auction place and got uh, all the furniture 
for the for the office that's up here. And for 20 years, even after we sold the real estate business or our rental property, right? I I just didn't have a um, I did not have a uh, <coughs> um, the studio stayed in one of these bedrooms when I could have had the whole the whole place. And all my friends says, why isn't this your studio? Because by that time, I was um, working for a, an, I had an art agent. She was selling my artwork all the time, and I was painting all the time. Just in the early, <clears throat> in the early years, I wasn't, right? But back then, the early years, I wasn't. But then, you know, here I was painting pretty much all the time. And in this little tiny guest bedroom, when we had a you know beautiful office that wasn't being used at all, but it was somebody had you know had to be something had to be done with it. it just couldn't be that, right? Someday, in one of these uh, talks that I'll be doing, and you know as far as the stories I'll tell you about the all the art galleries that. Um, that, 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 you know, as an artist, how you want to be in an art gallery and the perils of being in an art gallery, the good and the bad of being in an art gallery, because there's certainly a bit of both, and, um, and how to find an art gallery that isn't going to rip you off, because that's sort of par for the course for a lot of art galleries, okay? Uh, lots of things. Okay, so now we're going to get out the little tiny brush I had somewhere. I know I had it somewhere. Where do you think I put it? Well, did you fall in the water? Did you get moved over? That happens to me sometimes. I'll have a brush and then I don't have it. And it's not in the water, I see it. It's not in the water, but cause you don't want to put these little fine ones point down in the water. You don't want to do that. None of those little baby brushes. Uh, no. They will get bent and they won't be happy. Red here. Okay. 
All right, so I'm going to move to this other one for a minute and finish this one up. Just a few little adjustments here. This paint's getting a little dry. To let stuff dry, then you can see where you got to put paint. just takes a little bit of time, so I'll have to think of some other stuff to talk about. So Dennis's real estate venture, <coughs> you know, really <laughs> sort of fell flat. I don't think he lost any money, but he didn't really make any money either when he sold the house. And one funny thing I can remember, to, when he got his, his, got his house, you know, the people had given it to him for free, okay, and he had the insurance money. And basically, that was a house that um, George and I easily could have taken for ourselves, okay? Um, we let him have it. I mean, you know, we had more than we could do anyway, but I'm just saying. I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, we let him have it anyway, okay? So, but he, um, he comes up to me and he's, he says, I know what's wrong with this house. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what could be wrong with the house, right? There's something, you know, like, you know, structural or something's going on with it. And he says to me, they don't have a closet when you come in the front door. I said, what? What are you talking about? They don't have a closet when you come in the front door. Because in Seattle, I guess, you know, in Washington, where we, we grew up, you know, people have a closet in the front door because then when you come in, you... Um, you hang up your coat. You hang up your coats because you've got coats, right? Where in Texas, you may have coats. And you may not, right? Don't necessarily have coats. You might have you might have some, and maybe you don't have some, right? So anyway, he was very concerned that people would not want to rent it because there were no coat. There's not a closet, so he put one in. Um, I don't think it made a difference to anybody, but, you know, Dennis. And as much as George hated dogs, Dennis, of course, came with dogs, and they stayed in our house. And eventually, 
we we got a dog when Cinnamon and John got married. They got um, they went a little crazy with the animals because you know when you're growing up you can only have a few so many and then your parents are going to go no no more pets. And, so they kept, they get, they had a menagerie. That's another story of stuff. But they had a big, I think menagerie is the good, good word for this. Okay, they definitely had that. And um, so, uh, um, you know, we, that's how we got our dog Tank was because um, they had just one dog too many. Um, so we ended up with one too, and 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 George took him with him all the time to work, and so George quite liked him, and he was a lovely dog. So you know, not sorry we had the dog. I'm just saying we, for someone that you know was against as a dog, and we had Tank at the time that um, my friend was trying to hide her dog from him, which is you know when you really think about how hypocritical that was. My friend was so afraid that she would criticize, he would uh, criticize her for. Um, having a dog, but yet we had a dog, okay? And um, I don't know, it's just so weird. But um, anyway, Dennis's dogs, um, he had two, he had 10 years apart, so we'd always have a dog. And he, he has, and just growing up, we didn't have pets. Well, I did, but he didn't from where he lived. So, you know, he always, uh, you know, he was just a big dog person. And I, I think what dogs do is, um, you know, kind of, because they have such unconditional love. Don't you think, John? Oh, absolutely. They have unconditional love, and they, they teach you th and forgiveness. Because you can be really pretty horrible before a dog will turn on his owner when he finally gives up on you, you know? <laughs> okay. You're too much right now. You know, that's it. Can't do you anymore. But mostly dogs are, you know, that they're wonderful. And, you know, John and I don't have a dog because we travel and um, that kind of stuff. But, um, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly understand why people have them, right? They're good companions. Yeah, yeah well, they're, they're kind of nice. And it's, a, it's kind of a privilege to have a dog, in a, you know, when you think about it. Uh, I think, you know, to have one and take care of it and all that, so. I always wanted a lion, something like that, but. You wanted was, a lion. Because that's, that's just stupid. You know, I mean, I understand that's just dumb, but I did want one. You know, some sort of exotic cat, because you know, once you once you understand that, that's just crazy. You know. But we had this when we lived in, when I lived in Aspen, we had a, a, we bought another condo one time and we were renting it out and we rented out to these people from Texas that were just multimillionaires. They came in with their own plane and pilot and everything, and we all became friends and. Um, I think, you know, and I, I just mentioned I had always wanted a lion. Of course, you know, I'm not, I'm 20, you know. What? <laughs> of course you want a lion. <laughs> just, what 20-year-old doesn't want a lion? Yeah, I mean, just. Come on, that's a given. I, know, you know, I mean, it's just sort of funny to me. I mean, I, I think about it now, and and uh, uh, it was Kukadu. I think I'm getting ready for the frame now. Uh, not yet. I'll let you know when you're ready. No, you don't. don't you? Yeah, I will. So anyhow, that was the, would, would we do rental properties again? Uh, no. I don't think I would ever go in that world. 
You can't control it. You know, it, it, no, and even if you're just talking about, um, you know, storage rent, um, you just are dealing with, you know, and time, you know, and honestly, you know, when things get bad, um, uh, times can, you know, change. As we all know, ch ec economies can change on a dime, right? Yes. Where th something seemed pretty good once at one point, and then it isn't, yeah? So, yeah. So, but for the most part, our tenants had had dogs. The dogs were pretty destructive. I just there really didn't seem to be, uh, you know, things had to be replaced. I remember we ended up having to get a lot of carpet, you know, and, and John George would say, well, find out where you... We need some carpet. Find us a cheap place to get carpet. He didn't want to buy, for instance, carpet at Home Depot. He wanted wholesale carpet. So I remember I was looking in the phone book. Back, this is for the internet and computers and all that stuff, right? I know this sounds crazy, but it, it was. There was a time when you actually had to use a phone, yellow pages, okay? <laughs> phone book. And um, uh, uh, I, I got a hold of this car, whole carpet company, and I don't know, it was a weekend or what it was, but they answered the phone, and I explained that I had this rental property and I needed to set up, I wanted an account with them. We didn't want to charge, but we wanted to be able to buy, you know, carpet, and if they had, they were doing like big hotel jobs and stuff. We, we wanted um, the opportunity to, um, to buy carpet on the cheap. And the guy was so nice, it turned out he was the owner of the company. And they never, ever did that. But they did that for us. So we had, um, we had this really good wholesale account with them. Uh, that, that, that the average person, would, you know, the average landlord, there's no way they'd get that. But we, we got that. Uh, because, you know, he, was, he liked me on the phone. And... So that was a big, you know, we got everything wholesale. Now, for instance, what you could do, and to get things, this is, I can finish these stories out with being a landlord. So one of the things that's important as a landlord is if you can buy stuff wholesale. Because if you can do that, um, you, that, that, that saves on stuff so much. So. Uh, in Texas, in order to become a business, you just got to go down back then, pay five dollars, and they see we now G GWC. That was George W. Cook, GWC um, garage doors, and we were GWC air conditioners and GWC pool, pool swimming pool business, and we had a GWC whatever we wanted to buy. We just went and got another five dollar license. <laughs> You gotta and, love Texas, you know. And then, and then marched right up into the. Um, <laughs> come on, marched right up, right up into these businesses. Showed them our wholesale license, and you didn't have to be successful at it. You just every every few years you just had to say you lost money, and then you become a different business, okay? But you didn't have to make money at it for a while. So we became the wholesale license, we, you know, like that. And um, so we, we bought, when we were building our swimming pool, um, which we did, and that's another story, but we got, we got a wholesale license for that. And we had garage doors and air conditioning. And then George uh, really wasn't much of an air conditioning person per se, but, you, you know, when you have that many houses, in Texas, air conditioner is everything, right? Oh, yes, ma'am. So um, he went and took an open book test at practically at midnight. I don't know where we were. It was dark. I was remember that, right? <laughs> he dark. took this open book test, for, and he sat in the car, and he's looking up all the answers. He took it in the car, and then he turned it in, and then we became 
licensed whole air conditioning people and buying stuff at wholesale. You know, you still do that? Just Seriously, still do that. So that's what he did. And so he, then he would still have to hire somebody to, you know, put in the air conditioner. But um, uh, we, we definitely um, became wholesale air conditioning people. And then it's wholesale garage doors and um, probably the garage doors and the air conditioning. And of course, we had the carpet for wholesale. We still had to hire carpet layers, people like that. Though he had that stuff. He could, for instance, put in carpet if he had to. And we definitely could still do that. Um, that was funny. And then, then we found the dollar wholesale for the dollar store. The dollar store couldn't be cheap enough. We actually set an, we got an account down there too. I know, I know, it's shocking, isn't it? I don't want too much more to that, John. I think that's probably I think you're about there. Yeah. These these paintings here. Let's see if I'm right here. And uh, so anyway, mm -hmm. that's you know being a landlord and. And uh, and Texas was interesting. I believe that Marjorie would like one of these. She hasn't picked which one she wants though. Oh, the uh, for uh, um, the red member. Yep. Okay, which one of these, Marjorie? Just, no one's picked these. The pink flowers or the green one, right or left. Slide a little bit to the right there, the whole group. No, that'd be left. Let's go to the other right. Oh, the other right. Oh, there you go. Okay. Is she deciding which one she wants? It's a tough decision. Well, let's let's see the frames. Let her see them in the frames. Uh, she wrote back THR. So I think we have to decipher. It's a game. She's going to make it a game. I love games. The no, it's tur. It's tur. Tur. Right? tur. <laughs> I think she's so excited she doesn't know which one she wants. <laughs> You're mean, John. Me? Just... I'm not mean. Yeah, you are kind of mean. That's my Boy Scouts. They loved me. The left, the white flowers. Okay, that one. All right, one so there. let's get the. Let's get let's that. Let's frame let's up first. Frames, first. You guys, you dry them yet? They got to be dried before I touch yeah, them. Yeah, let me dry them while he finds the frames. <laughs> I walk over there and pick it up off the floor. I walk up there. Have Marjorie's first. Okay. All right. We're just uh, putting them in a frame here, so we can kind of see how they look. Just to give you an idea of what a final museum quality painting looks like. I don't know. I can't see it. Oh, you want to see it? Huh? Oh. That came out. <laughs> Are you surprising yourself? Every once in a while it surprises me. I go, look at that. <laughs> look at that. Okay. I can really paint. And I can see there. Uh, let's see. 
can, I, I would sign it right, I think, right here, maybe, or maybe right here. I don't want to take away from the white flower, so I'll sign it right here. And that's why it's important to see where it is in the frame. Well, Murphy, that's the one you want, right? It's being signed as we speak. Look at that. You're, you're seeing, you saw your painting be created. What other place can you do that except right here? Yeah, huh? The things That's, we offer you guys. Mm. Well, I mean, and again, we appreciate everybody that's taking advantage of our special. Um, uh, this is kind of, you know, it's way cool that you're, you know, that you're doing that. Put my red slash to the name. Okay. Any ideas on Van Dyke Brown? I missed that conversation on the Van Dyke Brown. Would somebody like to ask that again? Well, the problem with the Van Dyke Brown is it's really shiny. Oh, I mean, it's like gotcha. shiny, shiny, shiny. And one time I did a whole underpainting in Van Dyke Brown, and um, uh, I, I couldn't even paint paint over the top of it. It's like trying to paint on ice. Um, and you know, when if you do a tree branch with it, um, uh, it's just too bright. Okay. So let's switch this one out, John. Now we got that, and we'll just do the do the other. And uh, these are fun little landscapes. And kind of the takeaway from that is that all the brush strokes are up and down. Okay, so here's the other one that we're gonna we're gonna do too. And I see just you know kind kind of when when it dries and you see what happens and you kind of look at it. Just do. We'll give me one second here. Oh, it's getting a touch up. Yeah, it just. Ah, uh, the whisk of the w grasses. Some of you to cut that grass. Yeah, okay. Now, so there you go. It's easy, it's, it's, sometimes you can, if you're using the same color palette, even if it's a little slightly different, you can do two paintings at once because you're not, these are the, both paintings, even though one was more gold and one was more green and so forth, you get the same feeling of that. Yeah, the same. Same basic so there's our, it, our other um, our other painting with the with the little uh, river, and uh, that's what I like when I when I see see it in a frame. Sometimes what I'll see is um, I will see something that that I didn't see before. Does that make sense? And so therefore, um, if I it just confines it right, and I'll see that. But if you're enjoying these um, story time uh, paintings uh, sessions with on YouTube, if you're enjoying these, we have I was, plenty more coming. We've got a lot of stories to come because <laughs> I've I've got all these paintings I have to do, and. Um, So Marjorie has not changed her mind. She still wants the one, the first one we showed. Okay, no worries. And the question is, what color can be substituted for Van Dyke Brown? Um, burnt umber is, and if you put some, uh, some Payne's gray in burnt umber, you'll get a pretty dark brown and put a little it'd red be, in it. Yeah, it'll probably be. It's a reddish brown. So you can um, absolutely substitute something for that. You can, you got a lot of, you've got some, you've got a lot of leeway. Okay. Well, um, I'll dry that and sign right there a little bit later. I think that's where yeah. the that's where I will sign it a little bit later. But thank you guys, you guys, for hanging out with us. And again, love your comments and what you think about this uh, series and, um, and what we're doing. And if you've got the opportunity to share this with others and get other people into our story time, maybe we'd like to get some new people seeing our channel on YouTube. That would be lovely. 
Help us grow our little empire. Yeah, yeah, help us, yeah, help us, you know, we appreciate it. So that's going to wrap up this, this episode. We don't know if we'll be on tomorrow because the dishwasher is supposed to show up and Three. we don't know when. They said between 7 and 7. Oh, yeah, that's what they said. Did, yeah. Have you yeah, heard from them seven today? Seven. Have you heard from them at all today, John? Boy, I haven't said Betsy, no. <laughs> they say it's supposed to hear, it's supposed to be narrowed down between afternoon and evening at 9 p.m. tonight when they do the scheduling. But they didn't do that last time. No, they didn't. And then they, you know, if those who came in late, you'll have to rewind to hear the dishwasher story. <laughs> right? And we'll have a continuing saga on that tomorrow, one way or another. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, honestly, that's just so unacceptable, isn't it? Honest to Pete. For Pete's sake. Are you done playing? Almost. Almost done, darling. Remember, you got 10 days left if you want to take advantage of the once-in-a-lifetime offering. I know we're not going to do this again. Probably never again. <laughs> I, you know, at the time, I thought I was going to do about 10, 12 paintings. Yeah, and, that's 10 or 12. And, and we're up 60. to 60 now, so. Yeah. What time is the Christmas day? Ours is going to be in the later afternoon. We're not sure. We're going to go right after Cinnamon, and Cinnamon's thinking she's going to be done around 3.30-ish. Yeah. Now, we don't know if that's her time. She's on Eastern time versus our time. That'd be 2.30 our time. So we don't really know yet. No, we don't know. As we get details, we'll try to put it out there. So make sure you get our little newsletter and you're in the Facebook group. We'll announce it there and there. Yeah. Do do, do, do that because you'll... Yeah. But we're thinking, you know, we are the late afternoon people because we certainly don't get up to the crack of dawn. Yeah, so I would, you know. Oh, we're up to 67 paintings now. Are we? <laughs> <laughs> she keeps adding them. <laughs> well, okay. So that's Two more done. That's, there you go, you guys. This was fun. I think that's really fun. You can see we got this one and this one. That's a tough decision between two. I like them both. Yeah, I do too. And I think that they're just, you know, you could have a whole collection, but, you know. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, we just uh, <laughs> yeah, so one, one per customer. <laughs> you know? Well, what happens if they come back and did another, another membership? Well, they could buy another membership for somebody else and, as for a Christmas present, for instance, and keep the painting for themselves. <laughs> now, we, we don't care. And we wouldn't you tell wanna, anybody now, that. here's a thought. If you, you know, for instance, like here's somebody, that, you know, like our friend um, in England who lost her job. Um, don't say names. But we know she lost her job and it hurt her back, and she had to drop out as a purple member. Now, if somebody wanted to get her a membership for a year because she's got to be on unemployment, um, we'll give you the painting. But <laughs> well, I mean, it's for you know, you're paying yeah. it, right? Yeah, so if you wanted you're to give her the bill. a purple membership, so you might as well get the painting a spot out of the deal. for somebody, you know, we're not against that. No, oh, okay, let's put our sign up now. Bye. Bye, everybody. See, it says story time. It's all over. These came out surprisingly well, didn't they? Not surprisingly. They're beautiful.